Maybe we can just say a bit about HDL. Again, a lot of primary care physicians listening, it's confusing. Some years HDL's in, then it's out, then it's in again. There are all these trials. What's the bottom line? So it's always I, there on a lipid panel. So there's the LDL, the total cholesterol, the triglycerides. We'll come to that in a bit. But the HDL, pay attention to it or ignore it? So I, I think it's important to pay attention to it. What I tell my patients is the more I learn about HDL, the less I know. HDL is HDL cholesterol, the cholesterol in HDL, or HDL the particle. But I think the key thing with HDL that a lot of physicians forget to do is when they see an HDL that's abnormal, whether it's high or low, they don't stop to think about why. They look at it as a number, something to plug into a risk factor, rather than un understanding the complex nature of this. And why is the HDL 90? Is it because the patient's drinking or taking estrogen or has familial hypercholesterolemia? Why is the HDL 20? Because they're using androgenic steroids or have multiple myeloma. So we try to understand why the HDL is high or low. But then from there, right now, it's time to move on and focus on LDL and non-HDL cholesterol, or ApoB. And I think in the future, we're going to have potential interventions that impact HDL in more of a functional nature. But right now, it's just not there. Are any of you yeah. doing anything fun with HDL these days? Well, well, I, I will just say we, we looked at this in Framingham, and the question we asked was, how influential is HDL right. if it's isolated low or isolated high, and then you add on other risk factors? And it turns out, because we've had, an, over the years, a number of medical students and residents come to see us just with an isolated low HDL. What does it mean? It turns out that if you have an isolated low HDL, but everything else is normal, so your LDL is low, your triglycerides low, you don't smoke, no blood pressure, your risk is low. It's not, it's not as high as one might have thought. But when you start add on higher LDL and high triglycerides on top of that, a low HDL, that magnifies risk. Conversely, a high HDL is only protective when everything is normal. So if you have a high HDL and your LDL is low, triglycerides are low, you're protected. If you have a high HDL but you have a high LDL and other risk factors, you, lose, you lose that protection. Yeah. So that's kind of the simple way of thinking about it. So Christy and I and some others here at the end table, we've spent a lot of energy trying to raise HDL to make people better, and it's been heartbreaking. I mean, we've come up with you know CTP inhibitors and they didn't work, and uh, you know we've infused HDL in a variety of different ways. There are still a few shots on goal left. I'm not optimistic about the ongoing oh. studies. They're not likely to to work out and. Uh, you know, it has been a very disappointing uh, pathway to take. Uh, maybe Jamie's right. Maybe it's about HDL functionality and maybe we can make HDL more functional. But I'm very skeptical. I think that Mike made the point, which is that it's a important risk factor taken in the context of other risk factors mm -hmm. that helps you identify people that are at greater or lesser risk. And for my in my practice, it's the obesity epidemic that is the primary culprit and that you know I, I, somebody walks in my you know I, they say how do you diagnose metabolic syndrome and I can I can tell right away it's a patient whose waist precedes them into the room when they come into the exam room they're probably going to have a low HDL. Deepak for the primary care physician HDL cholesterol is still a good marker of risk I don't know if it's a risk factor it's a marker and in particular going back forever, the ratio of total cholesterol to HDL, which is basically why the pool court equation puts them both in there, that's really driven by the non-HDL right. to HDL. So that means you have lots of ApoB or non-HDL, low HDL. Those people are at increased risk. It is not a target of therapy at the present time. So it's a risk marker, useful if someone has a low HDL, like James said, why is it low? Are they at high risk? Do, do some risk assessment. But the treatment is not, it's the same thing as if someone has a high calcium score, I don't send them to a chelation center uh, uh, with it. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't, there was a big. Steve's a big focus. believer in chelation, by the way. He, he, he sends patients to it all. I've been trying to get him to stop, but he just keeps sending I, them. I think the other key point, though, that, that Mike pointed out is, is that there are, there are patients who come in and they have inherited LDL disorders, FH often women with high HDL who have been told that that's protecting them. And I think the other take-home message for, for, for primary care physicians is that not, that's not the case. 
and you shouldn't not treat someone with a high LDL if their HDL is high. How many times? That 20, 30 years ago. Right. That was, that was exactly. the How many times do you hear that? Somebody comes in and they said, well, I want your second opinion. My, my doctor said that, you know, I do have a high LDL, but my HDL is really high, right. so I'm okay. And, there, and people are still looking at HDL, ALDL, HDL ratios well, that and all that. thinking persists. It and really that, is that, persistent. That is very hard to stamp out. Um, but, you know, if I could maybe once again emphasize the point that the lifelong area under the LDL curve is a very good predictor of what will happen. And that if you have a high, if you have a moderately high LDL from childhood on, you have a lot of risk, and that's a lot of people. And, and I see them, and they come in, and they're 45 years old, and they've never had an, a cholesterol checked, ever. Yeah, that can't be good public health practice. Yeah. And so, you know, I tell people, you know, sometime, you know, maybe by around age 20, and, and some people are suggesting, you know, I know the pediatricians now are talking about doing this even younger, just once. Because if you can't pick out those kids that have FH, you can't, you can't impact on their practice.